Hi, this is Marlene and a warm welcome from Glasgow, Scotland to all around the world. In this series of Marlene and Friends, I'll be sharing with you the most amazing group of people who have all the skills and expertise to make our world one of health and peace for all who live here, humans and non-humans alike. Hi, my guest today is the fantastic Christina Pirello, the Emmy Award winning host of Christina Cooks, one of public television's longest running shows which is dedicated to vegetarian cooking. Christina is a fantastic teacher, a lecturer, an advocate for healthy living. She's the author of so many books and a contributor to the Huffington Post, Examiner.com, One Green Planet and much more. She's also the founder of Christina Pirello's Health Foundation Initiative, a non-profit organisation which is dedicated to changing America's relationship with food through community outreach, media programmes and her Grow Up Healthy six-part in-school programme. The work from Christina is quite frankly life-changing. Visit Christina's website at christinacooks.com and christinaparello.org. Hi, I'm Marlene Watson Tara in service for a healthy world. I am so thrilled not only to have some girl power with me on today's interview, but to welcome America's healthy cooking teacher, the one and only Christina Perello. Food is our future, which is the title of my series, so who better than to interview Miss Christina? Welcome, Christina. How is it in Philadelphia? Cold? Well, it, it's, uh, it's as you would say, bloody cold today. <laughs> but, uh, you know, but it's fine. I mean, I long for summer, but it'll be here soon, it with any be. luck. <laughs> it well, it's the same here too, actually. I mean, we've been having a lot of flooding, but today's cold, snow, snow yesterday and some more forecast. So, Hi. thank you so much. I know how busy you are and I appreciate you taking oh, the time. Pleasure. Okay. Christina, really, you know, I don't know anybody on the planet actually who knows healthy cooking like you. Seriously, long before it was trendy, you yeah. were so invested in food and health and cooking with whole organic natural ingredients. I mean, I'm talking decades ago. You know, even um, exploding the link between diet and health, you've been teaching cooking classes, quite frankly, to anybody that's willing to learn. I mean, I think right. you probably even bring them in off the streets for free because you're changing we lives. Have to. Yeah, all the time <laughs> if you have to. So, with all of that experience, with your passion, with your fabulous attitude, and I know you can view that weekly on your Emmy winning award show, Christina, which we obviously yeah. don't get over here, but we can tune in online. Um, yeah. It's been running for how long? 12 years? Yeah, about 12 years. We're about to start filming our, uh, yeah, our 10th season. Yeah. Wow, wow. How exciting. Oh my goodness, yeah. that's unbelievable. Well, one of the most important things that I want to really go over with you today is I've got so many questions, um, but people who abandon a modern diet and adopt a diet of whole unprocessed foods cooked in the ways of their ancestors, they get healthier, they reverse the disease, and you are one of those people, you know. Um, yeah. I don't know if people listening in today are not aware of your story. It's phenomenal. As you saw for yourself in your own life with your return to health from cancer, would you like to share that with the audience? Well, I'll give you the, the quick version. And if yeah. someone wants to read the long, detailed story, they could do it on the website. It, you know, the whole story is there. But basically, at, um, at 26, I was diagnosed with stage 4 leukemia. And um, told that, you know, game over, which is a really hard thing to hear when you're 26. Part sure. of you thinks, oh, come on. And part of you thinks, wait a minute, like, wait a minute. So I was going to move back to Italy because I had lived in Italy a couple of years before and, you know, forget about the whole thing. And a friend of mine said, um, you have to meet this guy. He eats this weird food and like seaweed and says he cures cancer. And I thought, oh, dear God. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh dear God. Well, sure enough, it turned out to be Robert, and I married him 32 years ago. And um, so I was a vegetarian at the time, but mm -hmm. you know, Oreos are vegetarian. Oreos are actually vegan. Exactly. Soda, vegan. So I was eating a lot of junk, and we cleaned all that up out of my diet and moved to whole and unprocessed. And in 14 months, I was cancer free. And I know people find that to be an unbelievable story, but. The truth is there's tens of thousands of people who've done this, tens yeah. of thousands who have opted out of the constant carousel of one drug leads to another drug leads to another drug and said, wait a minute, I'm going to take control back. I'm going to figure out how to get better without that mm -hmm. or see if I can. So, you know, like all these years later in my ideal world, 
people would see a nutritionist when they first get diagnosed. And we would use food to strengthen their immune function and try to get their body back in balance and see if the disease reverses before we start with these terrible invasive surgeries and treatments. So like for me, the biggest lesson I took away from this was, particularly as Americans, we have not one clue as to the power of food. Not a clue. I would absolutely agree 100% with you. And talking about that, we both are wearing our chef's jackets today. And the reason yeah. being, you've been teaching, I've been teaching, but apart from that, it's so exciting. I want to share with the world because you are going to be coming to the UK and you're going to be on television, national television over here very soon because things are happening over here. And what a gift, very exciting. What a gift that will be for the UK. There is no one like you here, you know? <laughs> No one. Well, so, you after, know. after they see me, they may say, thank goodness. But <laughs> Well, get ready to be bombarded by red-headed, Italian, Irish, Americano, Christina Perello. <laughs> sounds good to me. Yeah, sounds good to me. I can't wait. Okay, fantastic. I'm excited about that. Well, you know, I love you for many things, Christina, and I know you're a huge lobbyist for non-GMOs, and like you, you know, um, we believe so strongly that we have the right to know what's in our food. Genetically modified crops, they will not solve the problem of the hundreds of millions who go to bed starving every night and, you know, like the ruination of our soil to, you know, let's not get into all that right now. But why is, in your opinion, America so behind in the GMO awareness compared to over here in the EU or in many other countries? It's a really simple answer. It's a one word answer, actually. Money. Hmm. Right. So, so in America... Our, our government bodies that, that handle our food, the USDA and the FDA, and even the federal government, our Department of Agriculture, are all subject to the whims of lobbies and special interests. And there's a particular lobby here called the Groceries Manufacturers Association, who is the lobby group for all of our processed foods. Okay. They work with companies like Monsanto and DuPont, and they lobby to keep things the way they want them. Now, the GMO industry tells us that the food is more nutrient dense, which has not been proven. They tell us that the, the farmers will be using less pesticides. And in the United States, since the advent of GMOs, our farmers use 83% more pesticides. Not less, 83% more. And the third thing they tell us is they can cure world hunger. Well, if you look around, we haven't cured world hunger. So as we fight the fight to get GMOs on the label, mm -hmm. right now their new thing is they say they don't want to put GMOs on the label because it's a process, it's not an ingredient. But that's not true. Because when you genetically modify something, you change the protein and introduce a new ingredient. Sure. So, so we want it on the label. But I feel like just saying we want it on the label means we're willing to admit defeat. I want GMOs to stop. Because we're ruining the soil, we're ruining the planet, we're ruining organic farming. But in the meantime, what I say to people is, okay, okay, they say GMOs do X, Y, and Z that we just talked about. If that was true, if all of that was true, I would put GMOs in my food, and when you picked up that food, it would sing the Star Spangled Banner. Yep. Why don't they want it on the label? What are they not telling us? I don't want to live in a giant experiment that in the next generation they go, oh, yeah, yeah. that GMO mm. thing, probably shouldn't have done that. So, and, and they talk about all these independent studies that they've done. Every single study has been funded by the genetic technology industry. Sure. So it's like the inmates running the asylum. <laughs> exactly. So here, and, and here, Americans also, how do I say this? I am American, so I, I, I feel like I can say things. Um... We have a great naive thinking in this mm -hmm. country that if something was bad for us, mm -hmm. the government wouldn't let it happen. We really believe deep down, most of us, that the little white-haired men in Washington won't let anything bad happen to us. Yeah. But that's not true. Like, that's just not true. The thing that the little white-haired men in Washington care about are their bank accounts. And the genetic technology lobby spends millions of dollars, millions and millions of dollars to keep things exactly as they are. They just passed through our Congress something that we call the Dark Act, mm -hmm. which is denying Americans the right to know. But the truth of it, it's called H.R. Uh, 1599, and it's um, a bill that would take away states' rights 
to put GMO labeling on the referendum for the constituents to vote. And they did it because in Vermont, we passed a GMO labeling law. And the genetic technology industry sued Vermont to not have it happen, and they lost. Vermont got the bill. Wow. So now, there's plan B is to lobby that Connecticut, New Jersey, Florida, nobody can put it on the ballot. So they're literally taking away our democratic right to vote yeah, on an issue. So it's passed our Congress. It's passed. Now it's going to be introduced into the Senate, so our fight now is to keep it from the Senate floor and hope that we get a president that would veto it if it does pass. So, well, so well, it's, a, it's a big fight for us. It's a huge, important, scary, and look, in the end, Marlene, we don't know if GMOs are good, bad, or indifferent, but until we know, I think, well... You know what I think. Well, yeah, and I'm and I'm with you. I mean, Bill and I we do a lot of work over here, you know, as well on it. But um, it's if it's natural, then you know, what's the problem? But it's not natural to me, you know. And like you, if anything is unnatural, it shouldn't even be on the table for discussion. Exactly. Like I always say, look, they try to tell us here in America that it's the same thing as when farmers hybridize. Yeah. Well, hybridizing is a red pepper and a yellow pepper go into yeah. a bar. Exciting. And they hook up and they make a baby orange pepper. Mm -hmm. But if a salmon and a strawberry go into a bar, they're not going to hook up. No. So why would we mix their DNA to make strawberries more resistant to the cold or tomatoes? Yeah. So it's like, uh, you know, there's there an old TV commercial that used to be on um, in America, and it, it ended with, it's not nice to fool Mother Nature. Mm -hmm. And I think we're seeing the results of messing with Mother Nature. And anyone Big who's time. looking around and not seeing those results is... Yeah got their head in the sand. Yeah. And I, you know, I like, I sometimes look at, I say to Bill, we're like millions and billions of little ants crawling over this planet. We have no idea. Nature is way more powerful than we could even yeah. ever imagine. So, and I yeah. agree with you. It's the same here in, in Scotland. The flooding is unbelievable, you know, uh, just incredible. The climate change, even 1% is causing catastrophic things well, across the I mean, planet. Look at the States. The, the East Coast was six. 60 degrees Fahrenheit on Christmas Day. Oh my, that's unbelievable. Uh, and so the, and so droughts in California. And, and the droughts that we're seeing and now flooding in California yeah. after four years of drought. So it's sort of like, I think that we better really quickly wake up and smell the toast. Well, the other, the only other way out is I see that we start cloning millions of little Christinas around the planet. <laughs> <laughs> how cool, that how cool would that today? be? <laughs> That's the answer. Let me put that to your Congress. Maybe, <laughs> maybe. We'll see. Okay, fantastic. So, you know, uh, good, good. Uh, you do such amazing work out there. So, you know, that's why we all love you over here too. The next thing I want to talk to you about is the primary function of nutrition science is obviously to study nutrients, not food. It dissects right. the food, it deconstructs right. it, and everybody's always looking for the magic bullet, and it removes us from the from reality. You know, so what does all that nutritional science have to do with us and our health? Well, nutrition science actually, like many things, had its um, its roots in somewhat nobility, mm -hmm. right? They were trying to figure out why people were getting scurvy and why people were getting rickets, and sure. so nutrition science was developed to figure out where there were deficiencies so we could fix them. Mm -hmm. But nutrition science has become, as my sweet mentor Bill Tara always says, the handmaiden of the food industry. Yeah, and. So now food science is used to create fear, mm -hmm. to create marketing opportunities, and to figure out ways to sell us more junk. It has nothing to do with whole foods. So like for me, of, of the books I've written, I only did one that included nutritional breakdowns of the foods. And I did it because it was a diet book, which my publisher wanted me to write. But I don't believe in nutritional breakdowns because I feel like number one, they're not complete. And number two, they only give us the bad news. There's this much calories and this yeah. much fat and this much carbohydrate. And if we think of food that way, number one, like Mother Nature made food sexy and made eating yeah. sexy so we would do it. Nutrition science sucks the sex right out of it. It's like, oh my God, should I eat this? It's got a carbohydrate. Does it have gluten? What about this? And so we walk around in total fear mm -hmm. and we eat all this processed junk because nutrition science has put a label on it that says it has fiber or it has 
whatever, magnesium. Like we would know any of those things if they jumped up and called us mama. Absolutely. So what people have to come back to is the basics of, like when my grandmother cooked, mm -hmm. she had no idea that there was potassium and magnesium <laughs> in a beef. But she knew that if she cooked fresh food and cooked it well, that the family would be strong and well nourished. Mm -hmm. So we kind of have to go back to that way of thinking because what's happening, at least here, what's happening is there's this huge backlash against healthy eating because people are sick and tired of hearing, yeah. don't eat gluten, don't eat this, eat protein, don't eat protein, eat grains, don't eat grains. So everyone's so confused that they either jump on the bag wagon of the latest wheatgrass, carrot, ginkgo, goji berry juice, <laughs> or they do nothing and just order another happy meal. Yeah. Like that. So we have to find this happy medium because people are not going to become less educated. They're going to become more. But I think we have to direct their education to be less breaking down the DNA of a carrot to yeah. here's what a carrot does for your intestines and here's why we eat this the food that we eat. So it's finding that happy medium because we are science junkies, at least in the States. We're information and science junkies. We don't do anything with it, but we love knowing. Yeah. And finding a way to, to like take people back to the kitchen. It's it's one of the reasons I chose to be a, a cooking teacher as opposed to just a lecturer. Because mm -hmm. I always say, if I talk to you for four hours about a carrot, you know everything there is to know about a carrot, and then you leave me, but you don't know how to cook it. I didn't give you anything. But if I talk to you for four hours about a carrot and I teach you how to cook it, I gave you a tool. So now you can use that information to go back to basics. Absolutely. I mean, that's exactly what I do. It's so funny, you know, because when students come on our courses, particularly our two-week macrobiotic health coaching course, yes. day one, they're up cutting and chopping and, and they, some of them freak out. You know, they don't have the confidence or anything. But... You don't learn by sitting and watching, you learn by doing. So I'm a very proactive teacher. I have them all up being involved. And just on the nutritional science, I know you're like myself, you know, you, you love Colin Campbell, the epidemiologist study. I mean, that's the only way that I really look and believe and love nutritional science. Me too. Me you too. Know, the, way that he, the way that he put it together. So, um, well, because what he did, what he did with his epidemiological study was yeah. not come back and say, well, it was a lack of magnesium that yeah, did. He was like, exactly. listen, their diet was this, and then sure. we made their diet this. It was this broad yeah. stroke, move from this to whole unprocessed plant food, voila, Pretty you're better. Sick. So, you know, and look, can every condition in every person become well by changing their food? Can every single person heal? Probably not. But... As Micho used to say to me, Micho Kushi, yeah. the quality of your life, if you change it for one hour, mm -hmm. your life has changed. So for me, it's not about how many years we get, but the quality of the years that we do have. I agree. And so for most people, they say things like, well, if I was sick, I would do this. Well, why wait? Exactly. What about the quality of your life now? Your knees hurt, your back hurts, you know, whatever. And people just... Because we're so removed from cooking, particularly here in America, we can't make the leap that food can change your health. We forget mm -hmm. that our grandmothers would boil a fennel bulb to settle our stomach or put garlic on a tooth sure. with an infection or whatever they did. Those, you know, what we call folk remedies, mm -hmm. which were in fact medicine. I know, I mean, ancient wisdom for me is, you know, I always say, Bill, who, you know, and I'll just let the world know, Christina Pirello is wife number two to Bill Tara, by the way. <laughs> uh, you know, they go way back decades, 30, 40 years ago. But, you know, it's funny, Christina, because even over here, um, people don't cook seriously. When, when we had uh, lived out with Scotland for many years there, we were teaching and living in other countries. And I came back, I couldn't believe the amount of restaurants and cafes that had opened all over the city. Yeah. It, and yeah. no matter when you go in, morning, noon or night, they're jam-packed. So, yeah. yeah, cooking, as you it's say, has become seductive. a lost art. It's, you know, it's quite seductive, someone saying to you, no, 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 don't mess up the kitchen. Yeah. We'll, we'll do this for you. <laughs> but what we forget is that we hand over control of who we are right. when we do that. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. Oh, it's a big thing. Yeah. And it, look, do I think people are going to go back to baking their own bread every week in their kitchen? Yeah. No. But if I got someone to make soup a couple times a week, I'd be 
really happy. Yeah, me too. Me too. Yeah. In fact, I'm getting more and more um, chefs. You know, that's a big part of what I do, but not particularly in my country. I go to other countries and I train chefs to become matabotic vegan chefs for mostly yeah. private clients. But um, I have quite a few coming here now as well, so that's great, you know. Yeah. I want to hear your comments on just the other day the new dietary guidelines for America came out. <laughs> Enlighten me. Well, every five years in America we get new guidelines uh -huh. to um, help us to be healthier as Americans. And it's interesting because it was on the news the other night and they said, regardless of what you think of these guidelines, don't worry about it because a survey revealed that 83% of Americans don't pay any attention to it anyway. So that's number one. But number two, this was a really significant release. When they first released the guidelines back in November, they released the first draft before it was supposed to hit. I think it hit in January or December. But it was really strong. No added sugar. Uh, back off on coffee. Do not eat meat. Meat causes cancer. We should eliminate meat from our diets. It was really strongly stated I was talking to Dr. Neil Barnard, and we were like doing a happy dance. Are you kidding? Well, as one would expect, mm -hmm. it's been completely walked back. Uh -oh. Now it's it's no more than 10% of your diet as added sugars. Watch your sodium. Eat more fruits and vegetables and whole grains. And be cautious or be considerate of saturated fat. But nothing as to where you get saturated fat. Don't eat meat. Don't None of that. It's all been taken out because the lobby groups went insane and said, you cannot do this to us. We pay a lot of money and you do this. So the guidelines are a watered down version of the only good part of them is that it does for the first time in a very long time say that you can be healthy eating a plant based diet. But they don't give it a whole lot of, you know, they say you need to supplement, you need to do this, but you can survive healthily. But they really, they, they completely walked back what would have been revolutionary recommendations yeah, for us. Yeah, it would have been. Well, you know, it's back down to education, education, education. That's, we just have to keep pushing out. One broccoli sphere at a time. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I agree, you know, 100%. I mean, sometimes I feel here I'm like a lone ranger, you know. I don't have anybody in Scotland that that is even a, doing what I'm doing. Yeah. Uh, you know, in terms of, you know, seeing so many people with sickness and stuff, which is not what I'm about. I'm, I mean, of course, I'm here and I help them, but I want to push the education, push, come and learn. It's great fun. You, um, yeah. you know, so what's next on the agenda for Christina Perello? Tell me, pray tell. Well, we have a couple things. One is we are um, getting ready to produce new television shows for mm -hmm. next year within the first quarter. And um, so that's exciting because we're we're kind of changing the way the show is and and involving more people so we can see how they're doing and how they do it and how they survive and how they work it into their life. So it's, it's an exciting thing for me because it's not just another series of, you know, standing in front of a counter and cooking, which is lovely and I love yeah. doing that. But it's more um, allowing the viewer to see how people are doing this, which is kind of cool for me. And then the second thing that's that's really big for us, and it's at it's the very beginning stages, is we're working with um, a foundation here in Philadelphia to work with inmates and educate them and change their diet to completely plant-based and move them into organic farming so that when they are released back into society, they're trained to farm, garden, work in greens, um, technology, and cook plant-based foods in a healthy and affordable way. And we're just at the beginning stages of producing this um, pilot program for Philadelphia, which we really imagine can be a life changer with like mass incarceration that we see in the United States. So um, that's really exciting for us. We are um, opening the doors on our little bakery project. Wonderful. To, uh, release healthy cookies into the world. <laughs> That's fantastic. Congratulations. Yeah. 
So we're, you know, we're, we stay busy. We stay Lots busy. going on. Yeah, it's the same over here. I mean, you know, Bill yeah. and I are constantly always involved in meetings and how we can move things forward. And, and similar exactly. to what you just said there, interestingly enough, we had a meeting in, in, in the city a few weeks ago with an organisation who's investing a few million pounds and they're looking at me to create the menus and it's for ex-prisoners. They're looking yeah. for me to create the menus and dietary guidelines and plans and doing some cooking um, and organic farming and stuff for ex-prisoners. So that's quite a, a coincidence, which I didn't know what you were doing. And uh, so that's, well, that's it's amazing. Such an, it's such an interesting thing because years ago, I used to go into a prison here in Philadelphia and uh -huh. have an organic garden and teach cooking classes. And I had such a good time. And I used to always think, you know, there's got to be a way yeah. that we can, you know, change that whole model. And um, then out of the blue, we got a call from a friend who runs a foundation. And here's this project landed in my lap. And uh, Robert and I are working on the budget and, you know, I'm in charge of the cooking part, but it's so interesting because it's, it's, it's several tiers. They teach them everything from character building to, mm -hmm. you know, so that when they leave, they are, they're pillars in their community and not, you know, becoming problematic again. So it's, it's an exciting thing for me. I'm really... Yeah, that's huge. hugely exciting. Yeah. And, and I'm excited about doing this one over here as well. And the other thing, we have to think of an, a name that Christina and Marlene, whatever it's going to be, because it's going to happen. <laughs> The, the series that I've written for the TV production company as well, there's six programs, and um, just like what you've said, it's out and about and doing really interesting, exciting exciting things. So that's definitely going to happen. And Bill Tara saying, Marlene on one side and Christina on the other, I don't know if I can cope. <laughs> He'll have to, he and my husband will have to be with each other for sanity, but my husband would say, he had this idea for a show called Chicks for a Change. Yeah. So good. maybe that's us. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, you know, we all love to laugh, and I know you're a great fun laugh teacher, have a lot of fun in your classes. So I've asked everybody to share with me, you know, during your career, there has to be so many incidents uh, that's happened that's made you laugh. So can you share one or two things with me before we finish? I can. Okay, so I'll, t I'll tell you my best cooking story. My best cooking <laughs> story is uh, someone very dear to me said they wanted to make lemon meringue pie to for when their mother was coming to visit. And this particular person doesn't cook, like at all. So uh -huh. I said, being sensible, isn't there something else you'd want to start with? And she said, well, don't worry, I've bought the crust and I've bought the <laughs> lemon curd. And I said, I only have to make meringue. And I thought, oh, okay, how hard could this be? So I said, all right, so here's what you do. First, you separate the whites from the yolks. And I took her through the whole process. She calls me up and she said, get over here. So I go over. <laughs> Now, in my career, I have seen meringue too runny, I have seen meringue too stiff, I have never seen meringue lumpy. There's a bowl <laughs> of lumps, and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, what? So finally, after a few minutes, I said, tell me exactly what you did so I can see what happened. And she said, first I hard-boiled the eggs. Oh! How else would you separate the whites from the yolks? <laughs> Ah, that's fantastic. I love it. It's that's classic, right? It's a great story. Oh, my God. Well, so, yeah. I, and, you know, so over the years, it's just, you know, you encounter people and they, I don't know, they do these funny things. Like I was I was teaching at a huge event and a guy raised his hand in the back and he said, what's the difference between being macrobiotic and being vegan? And I said, well, you know, macrobiotics, 99.9% .9 of us are plant-based vegans. I said, there's a small percentage of people who enjoy fish now and then or feel like they need fish now and then. So he's in the back of the room and he starts yelling over and over, murder, murder, murder. And I'm thinking, wait, I'm a vegan. What are, you, like, what are you yelling at me for? So he finally comes up. There's hundreds of people in the room. He comes up. He's standing right in my face. And he's yelling and yelling. And he said, and finally I said to him, listen, you can reserve your compassion for fish. And I'll reserve my compassion for people. And do you know how you'll know that? And he said, no. I said, I'm not going to deck you right now. <laughs> so, you know. But you yeah. meet all kinds. Most 90% yeah. of the people I meet, I teach classes once a month here in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And most of the people I meet are great. Some of them are as crazy as the day is long. And, uh, you know, I just walk around scratching my head a lot. <laughs> yeah, uh, and me too. You know, in fact, one of the funny things that happened to me recently uh, was uh, I'm a huge proponent of, I teach all my students how to grow um, sprout 
uh, sprout at home, you know, so do mung beans and lentils and chickpeas and everything. So this woman came on a cooking class and it was one of the things that she wanted to learn and uh, weeks passed and weeks passed and she sent an email and said, Marlene, I've tried and I've tried and I've tried and I don't know what's wrong but my chickpeas, they just won't sprout. And I thought, well, you know, are you rinsing twice a day and do taking... She was trying to sprout chickpeas from a can. Of course, cooked chickpeas, yeah. you? Yeah, and I said, no, 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 they don't work. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow, well, it's good to laugh, you know. And Christina, you're just such a joy. You bring so much fun and laughter to the world. Your education is just incredible. Your educational programs, you know, uh, I just love you. And I remember way back when I was writing my first book, you're so generous of spirit and you share your work with the world, you know, and, and I needed some recipes and you said, oh, you know, take what you need, take what you want. And, and, you know, that's quite a gift because, you know, a lot of people, it's like, this is my stuff, this is my stuff. And you just, you give it all out. Um, and I know you've got a fabulous... At the end of the day, at the end of the day, Marlene, none of this is ours. Yeah. You know, we're I giving a very it to wise share. teacher, a very wise mentor who said to me, yeah. I think you might know him, um... <laughs> said to me once that if I say something to you and it resonates and it makes sense, I didn't really teach you anything. All I did was help you remember because every human knows this. Every single one of us knows when we put that candy bar in our mouth that there's a better choice. Every exactly. single one of us knows we could do better no matter how economically challenged you are or how affluent you are. But it's easier not to. It's easier not to remember. It's easier not to pay attention. So for me, even though sometimes I feel like you, like every day I get up and push a rock uphill, but the rock's getting smaller. There's more people pushing. There's more people worried about the planet. And I think yeah. that, I think we're moving into a very optimistic time. So, so for me, there's a whole world of sick people out there or people who need to change or people who want to not become sick. So if I have a recipe that I can share that will help or information, um, um, it's not mine. It's not mine to keep. So I, I agree. And it's, it's beautiful. You're such a, you have such a lovely soul. So I can't wait till you get over here and, um, you know, it will, yeah, it will happen. And we'll, we'll start rocking the UK and we'll start rocking Europe with uh, Christina and Marlene show, whatever it's going to be. And we just keep pushing forward, stay strong. And by the way, you look fantastic. I can't believe 6 0. Oh. Wow. <laughs> yes. Just Where are the wrinkles? I don't see any. You look amazing. And I wish you Thank the you. next decade and beyond and another decade and beyond to keep pushing out your fantastic energy and passion to the world, Christina. We all love you. So thanks a Thank million so for taking the time. Give kisses to our husband. I will do. All right. Take care. Thanks, Christina. Bye. Bye.